Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Understanding Representation in the Historical Canon. Uh, this is first of three part series entitled Invisible Influences, Examining Absence in Popular Narratives. My name is Shakur Ward. I am Director of Learning Development and Equity at Tulane Libraries, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this event. Now, the catalyst for the series is The Extraordinary Life of Joseph Bologna, Chevalier de Saint Georges, whose absence from musical and military history canons inspired this series that examines presence and absence in popular historical narratives, as well as how they are sustained or disrupted. Our purpose here today is to create the space for a conversation that takes a broad look at race and representation that is, is not present in the popular historical imagination. Now we have a distinguished panel and an experienced moderator who will guide us through the session. Before I turn things over to our moderator, Lisa Hooper, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. I'll start from my, my right, Dr. Denise Frazier. Dr. Frazier is the Assistant Director of the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South at Tulane University, a place-based research center that grants fellowships and organizes public programming, immersive experiences, and collective contemplation about the bioregion stretching from Texas to Florida and its connections with other regions around the world. Her research interests currently include the Gulf South and the Anthropocene, sound studies in the political, social, digital, natural, and built environments of the Gulf South and Circum Caribbean. She is also the manager, co-founder, and violinist, vocalist, percussionist of Le Senenel. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, Le Senenel. Okay. Or you would, you would be able to <laughs> say it correctly, Joseph. Yeah, Le Senenel. It's a French word. <laughs> which is a string, uh, string and technological interfacing ensemble that performs African diasporic music through a prismatic lens that honors African and indigenous ancestors and chronicles ecological realities. Next, we have Demi Ward. Demi is a sound artist and researcher committed to the embodiment and insurgent practices of the Black Creole diaspora over time. Demi's work centralizes well-being through physical and artistic lenses, prioritizing care and an element of Black futurity. Next, we have Giovanna Joseph. As founder and artistic director of the award-winning Opera Creole, Ms. Joseph's research on 19th century New Orleans free classical and operatic composers of color in Creole history and heritage has been featured in the New Yorker Southern Living Magazine. She was previously honored as a standard bearer of Louisiana Culture on the Grand Tour, a documentary for French TV and locally on Music Inside Out. Her most recent cover articles are in Breakthrough, Ma Breakthrough Media Magazine and Nola Boomer's Magazine. Since 2011, the international soloist, arts integration specialist, and university lecturer, along with her daughter, Aria Mason, Opera Creole co-founder, has received awards for mounting lost or rarely heard operas by composers of color. Ms. Joseph received the Torchbearers Award from the New Orleans Regional Chapter of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women in 2022. She also teaches a new class for Loyola's College of Music and Media called Opera, Classical Music, and Race. And last, but certainly not least, we have our conductor for today, Lisa Hooper. As head of media services, Lisa supports a staff and student library worker, uh, student library worker team dedicated to ensuring visitors have access to our extensive media collections as well as creative technology. Lisa also works with the music and dance and theater departments to build collections and provide instructional and research support. She is also responsible for collecting film across all disciplines. 
I don't think we could, we could have had a, a better qualified panel and moderator to address the questions we will raise today. We'll have a Q&A session at the end and we'll try to uh, take, take questions submitted in the Zoom chat if time permits. And I won't take any more time. I'll turn things over to Lisa. And, and Lisa, I invite you to take it from here. Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, just a shout out first to everybody in Zoomland. I'm actually really pleased and relieved to see a lot of familiar names and faces. So thank you all for joining us. It's really nice to have you there in Zoomland. Yes, you are just in time. Come on in, come on in. Um, thank y'all. So actually, uh, Shakur, as Roseanne gets settled in, there she is. As Roseanne gets settled in, do you want to do her quick bio? And we'll get her set up. Thank you. You're not able to see yet in the Zoom land, but soon you will see our, our final panelists who just arrived, Dr. Laura Roseanne Adderley. Welcome. Dr. Adderley is an associate professor in the Department of History at Tulane University School of Arts. Dr. Adderley specializes in the history of African diaspora, the Atlantic slave trade, black enslavement in the Americas, Caribbean history, and African American history. Her current book project is tentatively entitled Archives of Atlantic Abolition, Slave Trade Records, African Lives, and the Everyday Polit Politics of Freedom. Welcome, Dr. Adderley. And so with that, we'll get started. Um, in case you couldn't tell, these mics are for a recording, which will be available online later. So we are going to work really hard to project so everybody in the room and on Zoom can hear us. We're doing the best we can. Um, and so actually, I do sort of want to start. Perhaps people in Zoom can join us using the reactions, and y'all are here in the room. So I'm really curious who in the room and online have heard of Joseph Bolon, Le Chevalier de, de, de Saint-Georges. It's been a long day, y'all. Le Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Who have heard of him either before you learned about this event or if you know the movie, before you learned about the movie? Show of hands. Nobody in the room. I actually saw maybe, I think I saw up to six thumbs up, which means you guys are all music librarians. <laughs> <laughs> That's my wild guess. Um, thank you. So, um, because the majority here do not know or did not know who Joseph Ballon is, let me set the stage, right? So, who was Joseph Ballon, le Chevalier de Saint-Georges, for all of you who actually speaks French, I apologize. Who was he? Um, he was a master fencer by the time he was a teenager. He is said to have given fencing lessons to the revolutionary gen general, Alexandre Thomas Dumas, who you might recognize his last name. He is the father of the Dumas who wrote The Three Musketeers. Not coincidentally, there's a lot of speculation, conjecture, healthy guesswork that speculates that potentially Chevalier de Saint-Georges was the role model for The Three Musketeers. That book might not have existed as we know it without him. Uh, he was a master marksman whose skill impressed the American John Adams so much that he actually wrote home about him. He was the music teacher of Marie Antoinette. He was known as the most talented violinist in all of France. He led the most prestigious ensembles in all of France. He was a composer who explored and developed the style that we know today as Symphonie Concertante. Um, and he did it before Mozart. Just saying. Um, he, oh, I just forgot what it's called. Not the Masons. You helped me out on this earlier and I didn't write it down. Freemason. Sorry. He joined the, one of the major Freemason organizations. And he not only invited many other um, brilliant artists like him, but also other people that we know today. Gossick is a composer that many of us in music world know today. He was brought in by Joseph Ballon. Might not have been without him. Importantly, he also led Europe's first all-black regiment. 
He prevented an Austrian invasion of the French city of Lille during the French Revolution without any bloodshed. Um, he was also the son of a sugar and coffee plantation owner in Guadeloupe, and he was the son of a 16-year-old enslaved woman, enslaved by his father. Um, and so by all accounts, everybody who knew him, that's a good point, John. What somebody in the chats just noted, we don't actually have his name on the slides. You're right. We will take that into note for next time. Thank you. Right? <laughs> um, but by, by all accounts, by everybody who knew him, he was the definition of excellence in everything that he did. He was very well known and beloved during his lifetime. And so why don't we know him today? Why did he become invisible despite being so influential during his lifetime? So those are the questions that we're trying to answer today. And Roseanne, if you're ready, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call upon you. Um, perhaps, so we, we start at the beginning of his life in Guadeloupe, which is Guadeloupe 1745. He's being raised up as the son of a sugar and coffee plantation owner in the big house. And at the time of his birth, the Code Noir was in place, and it, it remained there for just a few years before his death. So actually, he was alive when it was repealed the first time. Um, and so, where am I? Um, right, this code would have undoubtedly shaped the world that he navigated, both as a child and throughout most of his adult life. So I'm wondering if you're able, and also anybody else at this table who has thoughts on the Code Noir, um, if you can sort of help us understand what bearing the Code Noir, uh, also known because I can't pronounce French, the, the Black Code, what bearing it would have had on the child of an enslaved woman to an already married plantation owner. Well, I have, I, you know, you did send me that question in advance, and I'll say, I'll say three important things. Um, I want to quote Courtney Becknell, who I think is in medical school at LSU now, but she used to be a docent um, at uh, Evergreen, uh, which is tied up in the same family that owns what is now the Whitney Plantation and Slavery Museum. And she said that one of the core lines, um, as the brilliant tour guide she was, that she would remind people was there was no such thing as a Code Noir police. Um, and in that sense, we can overthink the impact of the Code Noir and what it actually said on people's actual practice. Um, the other person that I would like to quote that is enormously relevant here um, is uh, Melanie Lamott, who was at Tulane and is now at the University of Texas, um, who has a wonderful uh, book coming, I think, in the fall about the way that and she's literally mapped it. The book discusses it, but she also literally maps the way that uh, French colonial forces of various kinds, and I use force with a small f, not literally mean military, that they're writing to one another across an expanding French empire from the 17th through the I, she doesn't go to the 20th century. And essentially saying, you know, dear President Madagascar, what are you doing about this? You know, um, this circumstance. Uh, she's particularly interested in how they deal with people of mixed race and children and these kinds of things. So there's this more so than what the Code Noir said, um, to Courtney Becknell's point, is that what were the, what were the norms of the society in which um, he would have been born? And then beneath that, to the point about no Code Noir police, the norms generally versus what were the norms in, in his individual circumstance. And that's the bit we're missing. And so in that sense, um, one of the things that is, you can't overstate that he would, have, he would have been born, regardless of where he lived, where he set his head at night or where he spent his hours, into a society that was overwhelmingly African. All right, in, you know, the thing that characterizes uh, enslavement in so many parts of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean is just the sheer scale of it, in a way that we, we can imagine it in Ascension Parish in Louisiana here, but the, the, the presence of that very black world as opposed to a, a French colonial world. So when people inquire, as they no doubt will, about the film, about his quote unquote connection to those people. It's a bit like asking uh, someone who leaves New Orleans at age 16, do they remember New Orleans and what it was like? And how did New, it is, it is, it is a perverse question. Um, the, that, so, and that's, that's thing number one. 
I think thing number two that is, and it's hard to read, is that there's an enormous amount of power exercised by the small number of people who enslaved others. And uh, while it was perfectly normative for even free and wealthy people at age 16 to be impregnated uh, by persons with whom they chose to have sex or not in this era, regardless of their status, it's extremely difficult to envision, to, to unfold um, what it meant to be that person. The thing that is actually certainly true that it was a fraught status you know, and one of which he would have been aware. Um, one of the, a, a, a film that goes off the rails eventually, um, the film of Anne Rice's Feast of All Saints, the actor who acts the role of the mulatto son does some really brilliant uh, acting without words about the, uh, the, the, it's a teenage actor, about the fact that they try to render, then that film goes completely off the rails. Um, what And that actually does spend time in slave society that this film, for the most part, does not. To my, you know, that, that it is at, the, at those ages that you become aware that something is amiss and complicated about the, about the way that white supremacy and uh, European supremacy about culture is. And, uh, and that's the world. On the one hand, overwhelmingly black, overwhelmingly African. Um, you know, just the, the whole cacophony of African culture and language around, and no way to escape like that racial hierarchy and his place in it. And I, I worry, I, I, I'm eager to wait to see how people read that or whether they, they want to sort of completely pr put him down in the world in which he landed as if this passed. Um, and I was just listening, there's a new book out called Fog about adoptees, I was listening to the interview with the author this morning, and, and even those who were adopted as infants, that, they're, that what the book is largely about is the way that people just erase that. And, and the weight of that world was not something that would, and just its sheer like, demographic and cultural space was very different, radically different from the one. This is just not the circumstances of his birth. Um, it had real consequences. Thank you, Roseanne. So, you know, when, when I reread the Code Noir potentially last week. Uh, I've lost track of time. I think I reread it last week. Well, you know, my takeaway from just my very 21st century rereading, I, I think that was a really important thing that we are seeing this through 21st century eyes and frameworks. Um, so when I reread that, my thought was there was never supposed to be a Joseph Boulogne, Chevalier de Saint-Georges. There was only supposed to be a Joseph. But what I'm hearing from you and the comment that you made earlier when we were just informally talking is it's really more about the context of his family circumstance within the larger framework. And even though my initial thought was like, oh, he shouldn't have existed because his father was married to a white woman with a white daughter. Um, so he should have, according to law, like gone into the same condition as his mother, which would have been slavery. And so I think that's that's actually a really important note. And so I'm just highlighting that. I think that our 21st century framework is a little bit different from the individual context of, of every individual. And that's powerful, I think. <laughs> and I think that's what Lamotte's book is about, essentially people asking, even in the 18th and 18th and 19th century, wait, this is not supposed to be happening. And then something will happen around property or something else. And they literally write, you know, dear person in Martinique or in Louisiana or in Madagascar, have you encountered X? <laughs> and, and how should I respond? So can I reframe my question, my second question that I had already posed to you just a little bit? So if his individual circumstance in his lifetime was clearly different from what the law at the time said, it was eventually repealed near the end of his life, but then shortly after he died, it was reinstated. And so I'm wondering if the reinstatement and severe crackdown and, and um, re-empowerment of the practice of slavery could have sort of contributed to his eventual erasure and invisibility over time, or is that my librarian conjecture? Um, I, think, I, would, I think that it's too... I think it's too much to, to essentially credit French restoration slavery in the Eastern Caribbean with, um, and I use in scare quotes um, for the video, but not for Zoom, um, the erasure. Because what we, what and who we know from what historical record 
um, in the weight of their lifetime, in weight of anyone's lifetime and our long-term memory, is, is one of the things that the historical profession kind of, and popular culture kind of struggles with. So I, there's so many figures that were terribly important in their lifetime that are, and are known to be so. And the one, the one that, that I sort of reference for the US context, that's an easy one, is Sally Hemings. Like now we take for, for granted how well known Sally Hemings was in Jefferson's time and who, exactly who all those Hemings descendants were. Completely well known in their, in their time, and they weren't, um, and in certain circles of both academic life, of certainly Virginia genealogical life, and certain kind of Jeffersonian circles, and as you pointed out, people who know a certain set of 18th century French sort of music traditions. And so what, like what erasure, what erasure means in what context? And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't credit the the reenshrinement of sort of you know the what they call my students always freak out about that. They were like, wait, slavery complete, complete revolutionary ended and then came back, and they're like, they're just like a gape for like two and a half weeks. Um, it, it no like, and they circle back on it because you you know particularly those of them that don't uh, don't know much about French colonialism. It it was a terrible thing, and I think something that. <clears throat> I don't know the, the literature on it in French that really the kind of social history about what that actually meant. Like, what does that mean? To, but yeah, I don't think that's the reason. I think it has to do with the way we, what we do and don't remember about the, circum, about the colonial and slavery era generally and how we sort of pick and choose. And I'd be super interested, um, like within kind of the, the people that know kind of the people that, within the people that know lesser known uh, musical figures, like you've got people on Zoom that know, you know, that Joseph Brunon is not news to them. And so in that sense, um, I think what we're reaching for is I think what's happened in the case of Hemings. Um, you know, I, would, uh, I used to teach a course on race, sex, and American slavery that it was very much about your question, like since all these mixed race people aren't supposed to exist, what are we doing? Um, and, but, but when I would walk around, I would turn the, my, my Hemings books opposite side out um, so that like, I wouldn't have to start with anyone about like, you know, that conversation because it was somehow politically fraught or like, you know, and in this sense. So I'm not sure what the reasons for or I, I mean, and the, the, the thing that I don't know is, well, there's no one identical to him, but in terms of like how with, within what music worlds is he known? Like, as I said, the same way I think about what I thought about the Hemings situation, like there's always people who knew all the things, all the things that are in um, Annette Gordon Reed's, there were circles of people and it's not, it's not, not taking anything away from the sort of the way she's transformed the, the mainstream historical discourse and it, and it is a gorgeously written book. Um, within what circles was that, was he known and why? And versus kind of what, what is out in what, and, and in some ways, Annette Gordon Reed's uh, climbing on the barricades for Hemings, who climbs on the barricades for Joseph Boulogne and to what audience? Because with this, it's very much a US political audience. Um, and I, you know, so it, it's a very different audience. Yeah, I think that's a fabulous question. And we are absolutely going to dig into his social um network especially once he moves to paris we're going to talk about that in a minute but before we leave leave guadeloupe denise i want to turn to you briefly because i think you've done some really um interesting thinking research and especially creative work on the colonial legacies of sugar and the generational harm of these industries and so what has always fascinated my imagination since learning about him is that Joseph Boulogne's most formative years as a child were spent on just such a plantation, probably straddling both of those worlds, yeah? And so, I'm, I'm a, where am I going with this question? <laughs> I have it written down. Um, so, like in my mind, he's among the first of these generations to experience and benefit from, from the impacts of slavery, very firsthand, and so, I'm wondering if you can, if you're able to at this point, um, help us unpack a little bit the factors that might have contributed. And again, this is a little bit speculative for all of the very good reasons that Roseanne just, just gave us, but sort of speculate a little bit on, on sort of the probably silencing and real time erasure that would have happened during his lifetime while he was actually experiencing these things. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, I just want to thank Lisa and Alan and Dr. Ward for in, inviting me onto this beautiful panel of people who I admire deeply. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah? Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, and, and just to respond a little bit to what Roseanne said, I'm very interested in why he is coming up right now. I, I was thinking about Liberty Place and, you know, Lee Circle is now Freedom Circle, how certain things have changed here in New Orleans. We still have signs that, um, street signs that are um, of uh, Confederate soldiers, right? So the history seems to me like a loop pedal sometimes. And I'm more interested in understanding the reasons why certain people are coming up because we all know that people of African descent are in, entirely complex and, and we've always had these histories and relationships, but why certain people are coming to the surface at certain times um, is completely interesting. And when uh, Dr. Adderley was talking, I completely thought of this, you know, in a sonic way, just thinking of history as this loop pedal that certain sounds are coming up and coming down consistently. So I just wanted to respond a little bit to what Dr. Adderley said and kind of question, I wanted to question why you know, why as well? Why should, why Joseph, why now? Um, because there's a lot going on right now against, you know, um, people of African descent. We just had what happened in Tennessee. You know, there's just so many examples that we can um, think about right now and, and to think about locally here in New Orleans as well. Um, and also just to just respond quickly to uh, Dr. Ward mentioned Lesenel. I just want to foreground that Lesenel, um, it's a, the electroacoustic group that Demi and I are part of. Um, we, are, um, we took that name from the Afro-Creole poets, the first anthology of African descended poetry um, in the entire United States was this group called Lesenel. And uh, so that was in the 19th century. And so that's, that's where that is coming from. So we are kind of a loop pedal response to what they were doing, what these group of Afro-Creole poets were doing and how that connects with nationalism at that time in this, um, in this place. And also wanted to, res I, there's so many things I already want to respond to before I get to answer this question, but I'll go quickly because I have notes and going off the dome is not my strong suit. Um, the, the Count of Monte Cristo, I remember reading that and having no idea about um, Alexander Dumas's um, racial history. But when I read that entire book, I was like, this person is a mixed race. I, I immediately knew it just because of the way that the story was told. There was just some, there was an angst there that, um, really, that I really connected with. And, it, and I wasn't surprised when I found out about um, his situation and his connection with Joseph is completely interesting. And I sort of had this different vision of Joseph after I knew about the, the connection with this um, literature in Dumas. Um, but to answer your question, I've been thinking a lot about this. A lot of the work um, at New Orleans Center for the Gulf South right now is connected with this idea of the Anthropocene, which is um, this uh, scientific epoch that we are in right now where humans have the most influence on the planet. And um, recently there's a, um, a wonderful um, exhibition of art at Antenna Gallery and 3116 Gallery called Art and Insurgency. And the co-curator, Shana M. Griffin, who works a lot of, um, on black displacement here in the city, and Amani Jacqueline Brown, who, um, who is studying St. James Parish and the environment there, has worked with this term plantation of scene. So um, I'm also thinking about that as, as I was like thinking about your question um, and thinking about this, this city and how everything relates to this idea of the plant plantation of scene. Our architecture, the way we talk, the way we interact with each other, you know, the stratosphere of um, positions and jobs and who's on the top and who's on the bottom here, it's really obvious in, in this place. And so that, that's connected with the idea, but um, thinking about the colonial legacy of sugar and the Anthropocene, you know, sugar is not indigenous to this region. It's from actually South Asia. And it was brought in the 1400s when a lot of this expansion with colonialism was actually beginning. And um, cutting sugar was in incredibly labor intensive. Um, someone mentioned Evergreen, Whitney Plantation. You know, I just got chills when I went to Whitney the first time and I saw those big vats uh, of liquid around the, the plantation. And I, I got sick to my stomach thinking about what it must have meant to have carried those vats of boiling hot water that was used for um, for cane, for reducing the, the hot cane water into syrup and, and what that process um, was for people of African descent. Um, and so these boiling houses became more prevalent in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And uh, Joseph was born in 1745. So um, 
you know, as Dr. Adderley stated, that he was exposed to that trauma. Um, he was exposed to this, this idea of the plantation scene, but he moved to Paris when he was really young. So that's something that we, that, you know, we have to contend with. Um, he was cognizant of the dangers of enslavement and the entanglements of um, what it meant to grow this crop and to reduce this crop into what we know as white sugar. Um, and his whole existence is, existence is a product of colonial entanglement. And so I, I, I've, I've heard his music, but I have to see him in that way as I see myself in that way. Um, and so his, um, his position as the, um, the claimed son of this uh, noble planner afforded him allowances that we can only assume kept him from the gruesome realities of actually doing the backbreaking labor. But um, that's an assumption that I'm making, but we can't assume that he wasn't, of course, exposed um, to the trauma of, um, of this crop. Um, so I, I, weren't, I wasn't able to find any, um, any information on records of his life before he was 13. Um, so this is a lot of speculation, but he was educated and you know, cultured in that 1800s way, right? And raised in a way that was afforded to um, an elite child in the, in the um, 17th century, 18th century. Um, and thinking of the silencing and erasure of his uh, lived experience is that his story is not easily told with the tropes of which we are accustomed. And so I think that's, that's why he's fascinating now. Um, he was a beneficiary of the colonial project, but that there had to be tons of privileges that he was not afforded that I'm also interested in knowing what those are um, because he was of African descent um, and he wasn't the child of a legitimate relationship. You know, his enslaved 16 year old mother was not married to this person, but I believe she did go with him to Paris if I'm not mistaken. So there's an interesting entanglement there um, that kind of connects with Jefferson also. Um, he also fought for people in the French Revolution and fought for the liberation of Haiti. So um, that's another nuance to his story that separates him from Mozart, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <laughs> the book that I read calls him the Black Mozart, which was completely unfair. And we need to stop that. We need to stop it. Um, you know, when history has uh, been intentionally um, erased or forgotten, um, we should ask ourselves what do we have to gain through understanding this history. You know, Demi and I are both classically trained musicians, and I was, I was very shocked that um, this didn't come up at all during my training. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking about his excellence also as a survival tactic. Um, yeah, I, I'm just curious about um, how we now, with more information coming about him, seek to uh, really understand this person in a complete holistic way or flatten his experience as an exceptional person of color. Um, when his life, of course, contains its own complexity and richness and distinction. Um, and also, who else are we erasing when we lift him up? Um, there are classical musics all over the world, not just in Western Europe, and we all know that. Um, so why aren't we lifting up other classical musicians from the continent of Africa or India? Who are those exceptional people um, who we still need to hear from? Um, but erasure and invisibility have a purpose and are part of the colonial project and are part of this plantation scene. Um, to disregard how some people of African descent have um, navigated colonial history. So I think understanding how he navigated his um, specific colonial history is, is um, so vital and important and interesting. And, and now we can sort of tease out who else, who else who are, we, are we missing um, when we when we make these comparisons. Uh, as, I don't want to interrupt, but I think the important, you said something so brilliant there about the black Mozart thing, because I didn't have articulate what's problematic about that, that there's there's all kinds of people of color all over that colonial world in which he's in. And this, the, the framing him suggests that, okay, there's two. <laughs> there's this Mozart and there's him. And you point, you, the, what you said about the elite education to which, you know, there's, there's people of color from these colonial entanglements all over that world. And where where sort of Mozart becomes the standard, then there's then there's a black, and then and then all these other people. There's a there's a there's a new erasure, and that's it's it's an exquisite point. Yeah. That, yeah. Do you want to go ahead and jump in, Joanna? I, I'd like yes. to jump in on a couple of things. My brain is just kind of running. First of all, I, I if uh, for people who are not as familiar with Code Noir, it mm -hmm. made me think about that. It, it's a it's a set of laws in how you exist. Uh, if you, your condition of your birth, you, you are in, if you're an enslaved person, 
you inhab inherit the condition of your mother, but it was where you could go, how you could dress, uh, and we defined, defied all of those rules in some way or another. When they said, if you, if you look white and you have long hair, when you go in public, you have to cover your hair because we want to be sure that you have one drop of black blood, right? So they said, okay. So they piled the, their beautiful fabrics up very high and put jewels in them and came out even more beautiful than before. But they were following the rules, but not following the rules. So it's important to talk about these laws because by the time they come to New Orleans, the laws even include Jewish people. And if you were Jewish, you arrived in, in Louisiana, you had X amount of days to convert to Christianity or leave. So it was of people, uh, they should have called the, the, the code of anybody different, right? <laughs> So, it, so it's, it's a crazy existence because we defy certain laws in the way that we do them, but we're living in this crack. And Joseph lived in this crack. And um, I like to give credit to his father, uh, which most plantation owners would not have taken their child into um, a royal society and, and educated him and raised him in, in such a way. And so it's one of those areas where I say, we, when we do right things, good things happen. Um, but over the centuries, we not only had the black Mozart, we had singers, uh, Sister Retta Joan was called the Black Patty. Um, uh, uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor was called the Black Wagner. They, they, they've done this for many years because it somehow boggles the mind that we are excellent on our own. So it's a, it's a, it's a real issue for me. Um, but Joseph lived kind of in that middle. Now, what's interesting for me, that I, want, I hope the movie will talk about a little bit, he lived in that crack. But when 200 of the aristocracy of royalty, of, of, of all of that were all beheaded, he was the only one that wasn't. But yet, they determined that because he had been a part of that world, his music was not to be played. And that was something that definitely came from Napoleon. When Napoleon rose to power and in his process of reinstating slavery. So was it, would it be worse to have been, you know, or to watch, to live and watch yourself be removed? That's what's powerful for me that I want to know more about that. But um, it's, you know, he, just like in New Orleans, we have our opera Creole is dedicated to our free composers of color, Edmond Dede, Charles Lucien Lambert, Basile Barre, all of those people that defied the Code Noir and are still, my mission is to get them to also be unlost. But what has happened in COVID, the, the, the advantage to COVID after the George Floyd event is there were lots of meetings and lots of conversations. In the opera world, I'm on national diversity committees. The opera world has really been talking about what are we doing? And uh, his name, of course, has come up and the you know, black composers' names are coming up. And then Bridgerton hits. And because it becomes this big hit of this period piece and you've got this black queen and people are like, what? So <laughs> the success of that, I think, helped. But I first learned about the Chevalier de Saint George when I was education director for the, the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra in about 2001. And I had been saying his name since 2001. And, to, and when Opera Creole made his debut, we included one of his pieces. 2008, before that, when I went to Paris, I broke my neck finding the street that was named after him because it was concrete reality. So there, there are those of us that have continue to was speak his name. Was that your initiative or because you said you first learned of it? Was that your initiative because of your interest or did yes. someone else? Yes. Because I think that's important. Yes. It's different from you taking that initiative yes. from someone else saying, hey, of the things you should know, he right. was included. No, no mm -hmm. you, you didn't find it out. You found it out. Yeah. <laughs> you sought okay. it out. I sought it out. Which yes. is different. You're not giving yes. yourself enough credit there. Yes. That's one of the things I was wondering, like, who is, who is not talking? And right. so I, right. I had some hope that the music folks were, but they were not. <laughs> Hey, a comment, a conversation that I had just yesterday or maybe this morning with um, Dr. Ward over there 
was this idea of, yes, people existed, but we need to do the work to be able to sort of start promoting them, start recognizing their work, start performing, start reading. Um, it's just about doing the work. Before I sort of let you off the hook, Denise, I, I am really fascinated by the work that you've done, <laughs> by the work that you've done about essentially mapping presence and absence in spaces. Um, and so you recently collaborated on a really powerful play with Goat in the Road and Gallier House. I don't think it was that long ago. It feels like it was just yesterday, but maybe it was longer than that. And you had a conversation uh, with Diane Mack on WWNO about it. And in that conversation, you spoke about the spaces that black bodies could and could not be in these houses like Gallier House, which is a very famous house locally here in New Orleans. Um, and so I know Joseph Boulogne was in Guadeloupe, was in Paris in the late 1700s, the second half of, of the 18th, uh, 18th century. And your work was set in the 19th century New Orleans. But what is striking is the architecture is identical the culture is pretty similar because of all the French colonial influences. And so I'm wondering if you could help us understand through your, your much later work, if you could help us understand the idea of presence and absence and sort of negative space where black bodies were not supposed to be, where we very much so see Joseph was very, very present. Um, thank you for bringing that piece up. The piece before that I worked I'm a company member of Goat in the Road, which is a local theater company that does immersive theater here in the um, city. Uh, the Stranger Disease was a production um, on the yellow fever pandemic. And so that is a part of this, um, this series of uh, reconstruction plays that Goat in the Road has been doing. Um, and it was a weird case of art imitating life because it debuted in 2018. And then two years after that, um, the pandemic uh, happened. Uh, so um, in this show, more so than in the subsequent show, which you're referring to, which is The Uninvited, um, which took place in 1874, um, when New Orleans was um, on the heels of resegregation in the schools. So The, the Uninvited um, was uh, kind of playing with that theme. And it goes back to what I had said earlier about this loop pedal of, you know, we're desegregating and now we're segregating again. And then it's the civil rights movement. And now we're back to you know, it, schools are basically segregated now, but we're not calling them segregated. Um, so The Stranger Disease took place four years later in 1878, and that was the show that I was actually in. And it told the real life of um, a woman, a Creole woman um, of African descent called Adeline Stringer, uh, who um, had a boarding house, and um, she was a manager for other boarding houses, and her lover was actually German, Creole. Um, and his name was Joseph Mathis. And it's a real life story. You know, there's documents about her correspondence to him. Wait, his correspondence to her, but I don't think we have a lot of evidence about her replies, but we know from the nature of his correspondence that she replied to him. So she was also literate. Um, and, um, and yeah, they had a complicated but open love affair in the 18, late 1800s here in New Orleans. And um, that translated, and how that translated into her trying to be the beneficiary of Joe's estate was a, was a huge deal, and it ended in a property battle with Joe's uh, brother, um, who, um, you know, who was racist by our standards. So uh, stories like um, these are um, emblematic of the fluidity of race and class in New Orleans, and so the, the story of Joseph kind of connects with, um, with that show. Um, but um, what I wanted to say a little bit about um, that question is um, what Joseph's story opens up for us is the need to understand uh, the complexity of uh, black freedom and black agency despite the plantation of scene. Um, I, I want to go to uh, Dr. Jessica Marie Johnson, who I know Dr. Adderley um, appreciates uh, in her new book, Wicked Flesh. Um, she mentions this concept of black femme freedom um, which I'm very, very interested in learning more about. Um, this concept provides a deeper understanding of the survival tactics that have been used to allow specifically African-descended women, but um, we might be able to apply some of these theories to African-descended men, um, indigenous people, to support their survival under repressive regimes. Um, and this is a quote from uh, Dr. Johnson. 
Um, black femme freedom, a fluid plurality, describes actions, expressions, and excre excretions that move beyond the fractional flesh of the traverse and the container of the manumission act and the practice of refusal, whether in rejected labor or demands or sexual advances, and even refusal to concede in officials to manumission disputes. Uh, black women and girls claimed ownership over themselves. And she also goes on to talk about queer sexual identities um, as fomenting a type of black femme freedom that dared to form intimate bonds with women. Um, and also mentions becoming black also healed as women, children, and men cast nets of chosen kin and community and relationships over and around each other, despite the cultural and linguistic differences in the nature of the plantation as seen. So uh, the type of slavery in which an African descendant could be engaged could be as diverse as urban versus rural, um, contract workers for wage uh, versus full-time laborers and sharecroppers and owning other individuals, which we see, of course, here in Louisiana, um, people of African descent owning other people of African descent here too, and um, indigenous people, as well as the case in Louisiana, um, perhaps in other places, even um, enslaved Africans, Maroons, um, all represent a wide variety of different ways um, an African descended person could take up space in the colonial uh, Caribbean and Louisiana and in this, in this culture. Um, and so I actually thought of Phyllis Wheatley too, because I was trying to think about people who I actually learned about when I was in school. Um, uh, so um, yeah, she was born a little bit after um, Joseph in Senegal. Um, and she of course went on to be the first African American woman to have a published work of poetry. And I believe it's still uh, Poetry Month, so I just want to say that. Um, there was also, I thought about Frederick Douglass, Crispus Attucks, Estevanico, all of these firsts. I was trying to think of all of the firsts as I was like preparing for this panel, or all the people who I was uh, trained to think of as these firsts. Um, so these are some examples, and we can be assured that we are still only like skimming the surface of fully acknowledging and recovering these stories of strategies of visibility and resistance. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what, what do we lose by flattening our histories? Um, what does white supremacy gain through these flattening of histories is, um, interesting, is an interesting, um, I guess, thought, thought process that I have. Um, so this country would not be the capitalist machine that it is if it were not for the displacement and genocide of indigenous people, exploitative, extractive, genocidal practices of enslaved African descendant people's free labor the raping of our natural environment and ecological resources. And how does that connect to how we think about um, black bodies in space? For the uninvited for that specific show, the actors actually um, were traumatized by having to stay in certain places in the Gallier house. So um, all of these issues that have translated over centuries live in, cellu in the cells of our bodies. You know, it's related to um, how we eat, how we interact with each other over time. And so um, the absence um, in our classrooms and the way we are trained classically um, is, also, um, is also really traumatic. And for, and for a lot of people of African descent to enter the classical world, and I know Ms. Joseph can speak to a lot about that, it's an exercise in resistance. Um, and, you, and I know I constantly questioned you know, why am I here? You know, I have, I, I was six years old when I had this old white man actively try to stop me from playing the violin. And, um, but I was attracted to that instrument. And it wasn't until later in life that I learned, look at all these people playing string instruments in, you know, in Africa. Look at all these people bringing the violin um, in enslaved um, colonial contexts here in the new world. You know, this is not something new. I'm not special because I play the violin. I'm a, I'm a part of this long tradition. I'm taking up space. My, my African descended body is taking up space unapologetically, but I had to face a lot of trauma and resistance to get there. And I think every African descended trained classical musician can talk about the uncomfortability in the body when we're in these places. I mean, you can even look at, you know, advertising for the LPO and, you know, it's, you know, I just see a lot of white people in those adverts in, in those advertising. I think connecting so, to um, what you not to, said, you know, how say the film will show this, that this is a person that moves between spaces. And I fear the film will trap him <laughs> in certain spaces that will look like an LPO ad. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, you know, one of the things that's, that sticks out for me, uh, my class at Loyola starts in the 1500s. 
And there was a free man of color who was a royal trumpeter to Kings Henry VII and Henry VIII. We talk about the Moors, how the Moors left Africa and made their way into Spain, France, England. Our fingerprints are, are on every kind of music there is. And for little kids to learn that and to know, I'm, I, I always tell in my lectures, I'm really glad that I was okay being weird. I'm, <laughs> but the reality is I wasn't. And what that feels like, you know, this, this missing of information um, uh, what would it feel like for a kid coming up as we were to know that we were standing on all of these shoulders, that we weren't stepping out and doing something that was odd or unusual. But our fingerprints are everything. And that royal trumpeter to King Henry VIII managed to negotiate a raise from the guy who was beheading his wives. He must have been very good at what he did, right? So. We need to get this information out. We need to talk to our children and let them know, be who you are. And I'm blessed that I had parents that felt that way. My father said to me, you, right now you live in the ghetto. The ghetto's not in you. We got a civil rights movement going so you can be whoever you want to be. And whoever you want to be, we got you. That's the parents I had. And that's the real risk of this film, that what you both are saying, which is a world I know nothing of. Is, is going to get erased and it's going to be great and he's going to be exceptional and there's going to be one of him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is, well, your parents sound like amazing people. They were. <laughs> um, and if I can turn to you, I mean, there was so much in all of those comments that I want to dig into, but I know we have m more ground to cover. So I'm going to turn it to you, Javona. So let's take it to the point in his life when uh, Boulogne family moves to France. Can you sort of give us a Cliff Notes version of the social circles that the young Joseph Boulogne would have been running in? So who are the people he met, he studied with perhaps, and what were those relationships like so far as we are able to know from the history left behind? Well, that's a, another interesting piece. Francis, one of the positive things is there's always been some faction of acceptance that we still see today. There's this, you know, we still can go over there and, and feel a certain level of acceptance. And so he would have had those people. Um, uh, his father had him, you know, training with the, the fencing masters. They could have said, oh, absolutely not, I'm not. But of course, they were accepting him and they were able to help him to, well, you know, allow him to excel as he would, right? Um, but in the movie, they also deal with the fact that there were some people who said, you know, in another world, you would not be this person. You would not be dressed this way. There is in the movie when he is the king of England, himself, uh, of France himself, wants Joseph to take over the Paris opera. And the, and the women, uh, the, the major singers, write a petition saying their conscience could not allow them to submit to the orders of a mulatto. So there were so many ways that he was in these cracks and crevices where he was able to excel, uh, but yet at the same time, there was the, always the pushback of no, let, let's, let's put you back in your place, put you back in your place. Um, so um, the fact that Marie Antoinette accepted him um, uh, so beautifully, um, also later, I think in the movie, becomes a problem for her, that she gets pushed back. Um, and, and if I recall, the, the, the moment in history about the French opera, which was, for those who don't study French music, was a very important opera. Um, at that time, it was growing and thriving and incredibly important, but they, the director moved on. So they needed to place a new director. Uh, Joseph Boulogne, by this time already, Chevalier de Saint-Georges, was considered the obvious choice and a shoe-in. Marie Antoinette was advocating for him to have this, but as you said, it was the three female singers who said they couldn't, and so the end result was that nobody was assigned nobody. to lead the French opera, nobody. and needless to say, it did not survive much longer after that, which is really interesting, and instead, Joseph Boulogne just went on to form his own ensemble, which was fabulous, by the way. Um, and so, but you also mentioned there are people who are pushing back, like those three singers, um, 
and I have this vague memory of reading this when I was reading up on his biography that, you know, he was not just any old fencing school. It was the best fencing school in all of France. Um, and when he was excelling, there were some rather, for our time and their time, rather racist people who are like, I do not believe right. that this person can be better right. than my very white self. I'm paraphrasing, <laughs> y'all. Um, apologize. <laughs> or apologies for that. Um, so they would try to challenge him. Yeah. Is, is that does that sound about right? Absolutely, to your they challenged him. They you know they thought well, you know we've got to deal with this mulatto. We've got to put him back in his place. And they just thought you know he's a party trick. He's just this you know exotic person that they want to say is something. And um, and of course he beats everybody. He beats all the best in France. And that's why he's like well you know I have nothing else to prove so I can be head of Paris Opera. <laughs> Um. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and it wasn't just in the fencing arena. There were at least three attempts that we know of where people, more or less in modern terms, jumped him as he was walking down right. the street. So right. he was just fighting them off, and then he would go on to his main stage performance like nothing happened. Um, true stories told yes. by his friends in their yes. own um, yeah own memoirs. Um, and so. This is a bit of a jump, um, just, but this will help me understand the way some biographers and people, when I read liner notes in recordings or sometimes introductions to some of his musical scores, people question his financial prowess because by the time he passed, he did not have any money in the coffers so far as we're aware of. And so I want to understand that narrative of was he really bad at managing his finances and wasn't such a great person after all because of all the stigma that goes with dying broke? Um, or was there something else going on? And so I'm hoping you could help us understand this a little. Um, so Chevalier, his financial status and also that of his father and frankly all of France, really ebbed and flowed throughout his lifetime, right? So France, France underwent a severe economic crisis that ruined many very wealthy elite. Um, his father, well, the estate, the family estate, under circumstances that I'm still a little unclear on, wound up going to his white daughter. I feel like there's a story there. Um, so essentially, there was no estate that went to Joseph Bolon. Um, and so by the time he, oh, he also never held an official post with a steady income. He always had patrons. Um, so by the time he passed, um, and he was an later in life, he did not have bankable income that we're able to tell in history, right? Um, and so when we look back at him um, through the lens of history, he can be, and many people have described him as living off of somebody else's fortune um, and other people's, other white people's financial skills. I mean, first um, living off of his father, which is sometimes framed as a negative, and I'm like, Dude, we all rely on family wealth in many ways, right, to get on. So I find that one a little curious. But then as he, he came into adulthood, he lived off of various financial patrons over time. And I, I have seen many people um, sort of be a little bit critical and hypercritical of that lifestyle of having a patron provide you a home, provide you income, provide you the financial resources, right, to live a very lavish lifestyle as he did and so what is shocking to me is that we do see we see this rapprochement against Joseph Ballon, Chevalier de Saint-Georges but not against anybody else and so this is where I really want you for people here and in Zoom really drive home what was it like to be any musician any composer during this time period in France what what is it what does it mean to have a patron and how normal is that it was very normal to have a patron. Um, I wish we had a little bit more of a patronage situation <laughs> in the United States right now. Uh, <laughs> so they're actually critical of that in liner notes because, like, we yeah. got that in, we got that in high school, like, literally in ninth grade music. That they it was. I was very excited when <laughs> a why. new score <laughs> was just recently published, and I'm like, yes, I'm getting this for the library. And as soon as it came, and I like stole it back to my office so I could look at it. And I read the introduction with great anticipation. Is like my first 
deep introduction to who this person was and they were like he died broken penniless and alone so this is a new score yes and i so was that's deeply the 20, disturbed that's the 21st century racism problem yeah, yeah. right yeah, yeah. That's yeah. And so yeah. i want to clear yeah. the air if we can newly transcribed scores are coming out yeah let's so, clear the air on this so let me say this there's there uh, of course his father provided for him and and i, I think that's a great thing we should we should acknowledge when people do the right thing. Um, and uh, there are two stories. One is that the father did leave money for Joseph and his mother, but the, but the uh, family said that he was illegitimate and um, was, it was not acceptable. And so they determined that the daughter from the marriage would, be, uh, would inherit the money. So uh, my understanding was that the father did have the right intentions in leaving him money. Um, there was a time when, when Joseph lived in the home of the son of the Duc d'Orléans, our, our patron person. Uh, and Mozart lived in the same house with him for a while, right. So what I was just telling my students at Loyola yesterday, actually Boulogne was in better financial shape than Mozart. Mozart was poor his whole life. He had patrons. Um, you know, and I, I told them to go back and watch the movie Amadeus because in the end, he got dumped in a mass grave, Mozart did. It, it, it was not, he was not um, on, on some of the levels that actually Joseph Boulogne was. Um, so that was at the time that was, you know, it was, that was the way the arts were handled at the time that you had the patron or, or the king would you know would would uh, uh, finance an opera and then tell you you wrote too many notes, um, <laughs> you know things like that, um, and so it's important to kind of put that in in the context. Now, after the beheading of Marie Antoinette and the king and all of the aristocrats and um, the the new order was taking place in France, people wanted nothing to do with those of the ex um, uh, aristocracy, and so his dying penniless came from watching himself getting rejected even in his music. And he moved from Paris into a small country area. He, you know, he did fencing as he could. He played with other groups as he could, but, um, but his, his status was severely diminished. And when the Code Noir and all that came back in, he just was kind of silently fading away. And of course, it's not his fault that he died penniless. It's not a lot of artists' fault that they <laughs> died penniless. We're out here trying to do our thing, right? But this is the reality of, of, of what happened. But we have to put that in context of Mozart being absolutely penniless himself. So, Is, is that a US or a French-based author of the line of notes? Because I think what they're doing, um, to something Giovanna said, that certain of uh, Joseph Boulogne's contemporaries wanted to treat him as a party trick to be kind of taken down a peg. And I, 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 I honestly feel that that is precisely the same thing and to your loop pedal thing, that what is going on in that liner notes is, oh look, the party trick is getting popularity again. Right. So, we, so will let's, find, we will find a way to, to kind of- To diminish. Take, take, yeah, to mm -hmm. diminish, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. And France and the U.S. have their own different versions of rising anti-blackness in this moment and hostility to their colonial anti-blackness being. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I, I was, interesting. So I'm looking at my notes. I'm like, I think I just asked that question already. Um, you, so to me, if I can turn to you before we, you know, have to move too quickly into Q and A, you do some really, really. I'm looking for my questions again. Some really interesting work, as we were saying during your introduction, in um, black insurgency. And so I realized your work is a, a lot more contemporary focused, but because you do so much thinking about black um, insurgency, and I think uh, Denise, you also referenced not necessarily insurgency, but resistance. Um, so I, I'm wondering if you could sort of think out loud for us a little bit, Demi, um, and sort of maybe see if you could find a way to frame the life of Joseph Boulogne that we've been hinting at already in our conversation. Um, one that sort of frames him as like embodied 
representation either in his life and actions of just being present in spaces where he wasn't supposed to be in excelling and leading in ways that our 21st century minds think he wasn't supposed to be. Can you sort of help us understand how that existence and way of life itself is a form of black insurgency? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, this time period that we're talking about 17th century Circum Caribbean and Europe were talking about a time in which blackness was tied to um, a sense of output or like a sense of things that could be extracted from a person, um, whether it was labor or labor in another context. Um, and I think that Joseph Boulogne uh, is, we're talking about someone who output was what he did, like what he did was be exceptional. What he did was um, operate within this system that's still going to extract out of him, but just giving them something different. Um, and I think that when we talk about hegemony and counter hegemony, it's a, it's an interesting thing, like thinking about like how does someone fight back against the system? Um, there's no one way to do it right. Um, I think that it comes to people in different ways, depending on your circumstances. Um, and we've seen this like over time with um, black art and music forms that address counter hegemony um, through different avenues. You like, you know, like you could have Joseph Boulogne like taking on this like bra coupe like type of like um, uh, idea of like this, you know, maybe machete voting like revolutionary, but like that necessarily wasn't the cards that he was dealt. Um, and I feel like he approached it in his own way. Like, yes, it was, instead of a machete, it was a, you know, it, he was fencing. <laughs> um, but I think that thinking of Joseph Boulogne as like this, this figure that was done up, that had the coin, you know, that was out there, I think of him a lot in the same way that I think of you know, like famous rappers today that like boast about how much money they have. Like in this same way of you presenting to the hegemony that you can use their tools even better than them in some, in some aspects um, to position yourself in a way that doesn't make you feel or seem like you're in a, in a power structure that is unequal. Um, I think we've seen that over and over and over again. Um, and I think Joseph Boulogne is just one of many historical figures um, that have addressed counter hegemony in a way that doesn't necessarily have to look like what history oftentimes, oftentimes tries to paint black insurgency as, which is like the machete wielding, like Haitian revolution, like, you know, and like that is a very valid way of re revolting against um, against oppressive and like violent structures, but there are other ways as well. And I feel like that's what he was doing. Yeah. Could you, you could you give the quick bra coupe? Cause we have an, this will live yes. online and you're yes, speaking yes, yes. to New Orleans. Bra coupe. <laughs> um, uh, bra coupe is a um, historical like folkloric figure in Louisiana um, history, um, much to my understanding of Bezuro. Um, in Brazil, uh, the story of an enslaved individual that um, takes up um, insurgent, anti-colonial um, action um, in their own means. Like it's very, like it's a very maroon, very revolutionary um, view on on counter hegemony, um, and both figures in Brazil and here embody that and sometimes like have like the mythology of like, you know, being blessed by God or the gods or whatever um, in order to like, you know, because you can't like operate as an agent for black resistance without, you know, having some sort of divine intervention. Um, you gotta be blessed to be able to resist against white folk. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's who Baraku is. Thank you for that. Um... An, an anecdote from his biography, and maybe you can help clarify or correct, but listening to you talk about this a little bit also reminded me of this anecdote during his lifetime. Chevalier was known as the Black Voltaire. He didn't become the Black Mozart until after he died. So during his lifetime, 
He was known as the Black Voltaire, who, you know, was his contemporary and who absolutely hated black people. He was a firm believer in slavery. Voltaire? Uh, well, I apparently. Knew he believe in slavery, but apparently, like, you're hating black people and believing in slavery aren't. Those are well, very specific. actually, maybe, thank you for making that correction. Maybe we do need to have a, a little more. We'll have um, a whole different series on black, on Voltaire right? and race. On Voltaire. <laughs> but what, what I thought was just this thing that sort of ignited my imagination made me go, ha, ha, ha was understanding that, that Chevalier, Joseph Bolon, Chevalier de Saint-Georges, was called the, the Black Voltaire. Voltaire did not really like him. Chevalier de Saint-Georges was accepted into the Freemason group first. He is said to have written the initiation music for Voltaire and to have been an intrinsic part in the whole initiation process. And Voltaire was blindfolded, so he did not know that this black person whom he did not like was deeply part of his initiation process. Have you heard that? It was in one of his biographies, like a big biography that I read. This is fascinating. So if anybody's doing research on Freemasonry in Paris, please dig into that a little bit more because I would like to know more about that. And for our local musicians, I feel like there's got to be a gig here. If, there's to be, if you have individual initiation music, I mean, we still have a lot of Freemasons. That's, that's, that feels like that's work since we lack patrons. <laughs> right? So, okay, so we are at 2.46. Oh, you, you wanted to add something. One, Please one, do. One thing that, I, that I'm really curious as to how the movie uh, will, will handle this and in talking about, you know, his resistance being the sword, the fact that he was part of this aristocracy and all of that, living as a free person, um, you know, in the cracks. Um, somehow he turned and said, I need to do something different. I need to be a part of the resistance. I need to form my own battalion. I need to go out here and change France for my people. I, I'm, I don't know that was his words, but something turned and he was a force for the French Revolution and, and a force later on that would lead to the ending of slavery. Um, I, I really want to know more about that turn and maybe he just felt it all along that he was you know, trying to do something different to break through and did it with his violin and with his sword and then ultimately, and he did it with, with other black men, which so we know that there was uh, uh, other influential people, you said, who, who else are we, stories aren't we telling? So there's a lot to, lot to unpack. There is so much to unpack. Um, from, again, from what we can understand of the historical record, he did not necessarily think him, of himself as a black man. He thought of himself first as a Frenchman, mm -hmm. second as a Creole. And so all of these labels that we've applied to him over time sort of are more a reflection upon ourselves, I think, than upon him, which I think is interesting. And so um, we do, I'm going to, I want to leave time for Q&A, but I want to leave on a positive note. So we know that Chevalier has long since been sort of forgotten in many ways, made invisible in many ways. Um, and many people is like, oh, his music doesn't exist anymore. But it does exist. It's being performed. There's a movie. We are having this whole conversation. Um, so he's being made visible again. And I want, I want to leave on a more positive note, see if you all have any um, reflections or word of encouragement or guidance to all of us here and in Zoom um, on, on, how, on returning even more extraordinary characters back into memory. Yeah. Well, we have many of them. We have many of them right here in New Orleans. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm in the process and have been in the process for a few years now trying to put a uh, never performed opera by a New Orleans free composer of color, born here free in 1827 of non-mixed race. But he wrote this, this last opera was written in 1887, um, 550 pages, fully orchestrated in French, and was never performed. Um, and he is um, one of the very first American-born black opera composers, born right here in New Orleans, Edmond Dede. Mm -hmm. Is the city of New Orleans uplifting him the way they should? No. And we never, we've never performed it here. 
it's never been performed in the world. Yeah. It's in his original why, handwriting. Yes, it's never been performed anywhere. Right. Well, why, but he why? has he has other operas that were performed, and we do some of his music, his his art songs, and and those things. But it is a project, and I'm trying to get the city to talk about this legacy of of these free people of color who um, were so impactful in New Orleans, not just artists, but when, when, when Reconstruction was ending and Jim Crow laws were coming in and those artists were kicked out of the French Opera House, they filed a lawsuit, one of the first lawsuits in 1869 to integrate a performing arts space. And the people, free people of color, revolted to the point they stopped buying tickets and the French Opera House could not afford to bring, to send their French singers back to France. We impacted the economics of opera in New Orleans in 1869. And so this has been our legacy that, you know, we want to, we want to share that and celebrate it more and more. I think that's the context of why this one has not been performed because it comes from the moment it comes from the moment when the city and the United States yeah. decided that, you know what, we've ended slavery, but we will have white supremacy back. And because we've performed others of his work, I think you, you've put your finger on it that that is the reason this piece almost cannot be performed because then it requires us to confront the moment. Yep. I like it. Any other brilliant reflections on returning people to memory, or are you already? It, it, I have a, I have a, I have a quick one. Um, the, the one thing that I worry about in terms of this conversation and this figure, I do think, and I was, I was looking on. There's these people on YouTube that take like black figures and translate how we would talk about them in. Um, you know, as someone who's almost 60 and what I think of the, I guess, the everyday vernacular of people who are in their 20s to try to get them to embrace. I'm like, yeah, we, we need that. I do worry a little bit because there are, um, thinking about what Denise said, there are kind of concentric circles of people. And y'all are still told, oh, you are the one black odd person doing this classical thing, where in fact there are, there are many others. But I do worry a little bit. I want this film to blow up huge because I want all the black things to succeed. Um, <laughs> see, I'm there, I've said it. Um, it's, it's, it's a basic standard. Um, but I worry about the, the extraordinary figure narrative because the, the circles get wider and wider and wider. And uh, to this idea of black insurgency in the everyday and what Demi was saying is that, um, and something that the, our brilliant sociology colleague, Dr. Corey Miles says that, you know, there's this black all rightness and we mustn't forget that, the, 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 the circles of it is what's wrong with being the black Voltaire and the black Mozart. It's not just that you're excluding the multiple people in those circles, but you're also, oh, thank goodness, there, is, there are these people in these exceptional spaces. And one of the things I was wondering is like, you know, um, everybody, they, these people have a circle still in Guadeloupe. And I was like, mm, what's that conversation like? All right. In terms of, you know, I don't know, if, for example, number one, whether there are other whether there are other siblings. That was one question. Mm -hmm. But also um, when when they leave this family and it is a family go to Paris, they don't leave a plantation. They leave a community. Right. And I was like, now, nah, nah, that's if, if I had a creative bone in my body, that's the play I would write. It'd be a whole series of conversations with news of him among them. Wow. And so that's the thing that. I want us to keep. I love is that. that people the same way here that it's not like these people were a secret. Like, you know, yeah. um, exactly we treat today like the, the the you know the people that your work brings to light. But people knew people at all ranks knew who they were. Mm -hmm. You should Google Boulogne Rum. Uh, rum in French. R H U M. Family still exists, plantation still exists, they make rum. Learned that yesterday from a student who's actually from Guadeloupe. She happened to stop me and say, hey, this family still exists. Are they singular or is it like well, the only Bolognes or is that like his cousin's room? <laughs> the, it, it could be family. There, there were two lines of the Boulogne family in Guadeloupe living next door to each other at the time. 
So I'm not too sure which line of the family this Are is. Are they making opera funding money? You know, we need a patron. <laughs> we need a patron. We need a patron. <laughs> Speaking of creative bones and potential plays, I desperately want to know more about his mother, Nano. So oh, Denise, yes. I'm staring at you as our creative person here, and Demi as well, our two creative people, and three. We, we all yeah, are. All of yeah. you. All of you. Yeah. Do something about Nano. Oh, right, Nano. Oh my goodness, that's her. brilliant. Mm -hmm. Oh look, a plan. All right, we have we I we're almost at the end, and I absolutely want to give folks a few minutes at least for questions. Otherwise, we will keep talking about all the wonderful things. <laughs> so, are there questions um, from chat? Are there questions in the room? Can I just? Yes. Actually, can I can I ask you to use this mic so we can also. All right, so my name is Ina, and most of the panelists know me well. Um, what fascinates me is where you come from matters, because the educational institutions in various European countries reflect on the whole black and white issue completely different. So for instance, I have an Afrocentric PhD from Temple University, and there I was a strange person where everybody asked me, how is it you being born in Germany, I have to say in an international family of refugees, where my grandparents were enslaved in Russia. So anyway, but that I wasn't aware of at the time. So they asked me, how is it that only German literature always places Egypt in Africa? while all, the, all other Europeans don't do that. And I said, well, Germany also never had, sla had slavery. They had colonies in Africa, but the institution of slavery never made it to what is now Germany. So anyway, it, it reflects it. But back to our hero here, the Chevalier. I actually did hear from him as a child uh, because I grew up in a music city, in a Mozart city, and we were taught in high school. We were taught Mozart and Beethoven, and of course before Haydn. But right afterwards, we had two years of jazz history, where they taught us that jazz was just as important as Mozart and Beethoven, and the blues was just important. So it does matter where you're born. And my introduction to the Chevalier is never coming up in the discussion here in the United States. He was very close friends with Beethoven. And I thought Beethoven was friends with him, not the other way around. Mozart apparently was his beneficiary in some ways. Of, no, were they were not? Uh, Beethoven did have a black composer friend, uh, George different. Uh, Bridgetower. Oh, different one. Different, Oh, yeah. so see, I've, even I got the wrong information. Uh, but, um, there, that he existed and that there were black composers is definitely a fact. And, and, and one more thing I want to throw here in the ring is um, it, Shakespeare. We're all familiar of Othello and Desdemonia. And they were legally married, please, okay? And that was acceptable. But that he was discrimination created that jealousy that that uh, Shakespeare dramatizes, but uh, that jealousy that he kills his wife is acceptable in the United States. But it's not acceptable that he was very wealthy and that they were legally married. Please, okay. So and that was the reality of Shakespeare. So we kind of twist our history a little bit over here. So all right, I have to say I'm American citizen now, so <laughs> I'm included in this twisting. <laughs> I distance myself, of course, as best as I can, but it's a constant process of what you say. You have to constantly resist to the dominant speech because it's insane. It's insane. It, it is insanity here. And the constant racialization is insanity. The constant, I mean, our history, I'm a historian. You cannot make it up. You know, when, when I'm sorry, this is my last, I take everybody's time here. So my last comment is when I read the book about the brothels in the 1850s in the United States by Judith Schaefer. I was stunned. You can't make this up. We had brothels where the enslaved person was the manager and the prostitutes were Irish young ladies. Hello, 1850s New Orleans. Uh, and the manager was the enslaved person who had more freedoms than the prostitute who was of Irish descent. This racialization is a bit crazy right now, and we project Jim Crow reality in the history that where it wasn't there. 
So that's it from, from and, me. And for the, for the benefit of the Zoom, Ina Fandrich uh, writes on, on many things, but on Vodun in New Orleans. And we did actually, we started off, you know, I wish you were here sooner, about this conversation. Like in what circles is he known in different ways? And that you brought up sort of the way people in Germany might have talked and known. And it is very much so much, yeah, a different conversation. Always in my mind. John James Audubon was born to an illegitimate relationship, but the lady was apparently, the mother was more light skinned. She was maybe a quadroon or an octoroon, but the mom died. He took his baby boy that looks just like his dad, and mommy, who had no children in France, adopted him. So that's how he became white. And there is still white historians that claim him as white, black historian that claimed he was black, and he was definitely easily adoptable in everybody's world because legitimacy made a huge, you know, I'm working on pirates right now. So the pirates we still know who got accepted all had legitimate white wives. The one who had illegitimate free black, of, free black ladies, all of them are evil right now in our history books. Isn't that interesting? Legitimacy has a big, I'm sorry, I'm freaking too long. Thank you. Thank you for those notes. On a fun note, I want to um, uh, end with something. It is perfect that Chevalier is being played by an actor born in New Orleans. So he has, he has the context of what New Orleans is and our French colonial history that he brings to that. Um, he is the, the son of a classical musician, Kelvin Harrison Sr. And he's a nephew of Donald Harrison Jr., our, our jazz artist and, and chief of the uh, Guardians of the Flame. So he's got this great history. But hilariously, the other day on the Today Show, when he was thinking how to personify this person, how to, he, he was inspired by Prince. He said, Prince, you know, so he wanted to have the, the bravado and the, and the presence of Prince in doing it. So I'm really excited <laughs> to see how he, how he, how do he does this at this acting? So it's hilarious to me. So please go and see the movie. AMC theaters all around the country. Opera Creole is doing a performance tomorrow night before our private showing, but we don't want anybody to miss it. Y'all are sold out already. Yeah, I'm sweet. so yeah. sad. Yeah. And to me, you have a performance coming up. Oh, um, not really. I'm, you know, I'm not performing. Um, one I'm, of your works is coming up. Yeah, there. I'll I'll be um, sharing a new work with Anthroposonic with New Orleans Center for the Girl South, um, based on the ecologies of Southern Louisiana. And that's when is the, when where? Um, on Monday evening at seven six. six. <laughs> <laughs> Rogers <laughs> Memorial. <laughs> Rogers Memorial. It's not just me. Yeah. It's um, Corey Diane. Um, is a brilliant composer that's also exhibiting some things. And um, this is the second in the Anthroposonic series. So there will be some continuations on things that have happened last year as well. Thank you all. Shakur, can you wrap us? Because we are at time. Yes, I just wanted to um, really show my appreciation to the panel, uh, the moderator, the guests, those who took the time to come here, as well as those who joined us on Zoom. And um, I would love to speak to y'all about this like off camera. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was just fascinated with the amount of knowledge that was coming from here today and I really appreciate you. I want to uh, remind everyone that this is part one of a three part series. So I, I hope you can make it to uh, the other two remaining parts and I'd love to see you there. And can we just give, uh, I'll show our appreciation for the rain. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I guess we're, we're off now, and I'll see you at uh, part two.